Led by wide receiver Jordan Addison, USC football could have as many as seven players selected in this week's NFL Draft. Hi, I'm James of Faithful Angelino Sports with a special report, the first of four on the upcoming NFL Draft, a look at USC football's prospects going in. If you enjoyed talking about the Trojans, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We talk LA sports here. The other uh, teams that we will be talking about, of course, going into the NFL Draft, I'll have a special report on UCLA. And then we'll follow up with the ideas of where the Chargers and the Rams might look. But let's get started with the USC Trojans because frankly, they can make a little bit of noise in this draft. Now, I have nine particular players listed as possibilities after doing research for the last few days on it going to a variety of sources, talking with a couple of people that I know who once played in the NFL, who they like as well. And I'll list them off and we'll go through them one at a time. Uh, obviously, I mentioned Addison a moment ago, Tuli Tuipolotu, the defensive lineman comes to mind, obviously. Andrew Voorhees, the offensive lineman who blasted out his ACL also comes to mind. Travis Dye, the running back, Mackay Blackman, a corner and Bobby Haskin, an offensive lineman, maybe even Brett Neal in the center. We're also gonna go through a couple of players that I think are going to miss the cut, but might get a look, at least in the NFL, or if not, frankly, rebuilding their career in the XFL or USFL. Let's start with Jordan Addison. Here's what the scouts love about him. They believe, there are coaches that believe that he is the best route runner in the entire class of wide receivers. Definitely sure-handed, definitely smart. He adjusts quickly to bad throws. And he is a battler. But having said that, just because he battles a quarterback for the ball doesn't mean he always wins. They don't necessarily like his size. And in addition to that, if you recall, in the combine, he ran the slowest 40 of all the wide receivers that were invited. So there is a question of his speed. Addison has been constantly linked as a first round draft, draft pick. Some have even put him prior to the combine in the top 10. Jordan Addison's future depends highly on the team that drafts him. There is a belief that if you put him in a West Coast offense where there is timing, where there are specific routes to be run to get open, then Jordan Addison could just straight up blow up and become a star in the NFL. So it all depends on who takes him. However, there is also an unnamed coach in The Athletic who said that he does not believe Jordan Addison is worth a first round pick. So he might go anywhere, anywhere in the first round. Top 10, I've even seen somebody suggest that he, the Kansas City Chiefs take him with pick number 31 which wouldn't be a surprise, that type of wide receiver would easily fit in, uh, in that offense. So most people have him going in the first round. The second most common high pick among USC Trojans tends to be Tui Tui, <laughs> Tui Pelotu. The defensive lineman, a lot of people love him in the second or third round. I've seen mock drafts suggesting, by the way, that he might even go to the Chargers in the third round, which would be a bit of a surprise considering that the Chargers defensive line seemed to be pretty set last year. He's disruptive. They describe him as intense, that he gets a great burst and, and off of the snap and has terrific leverage and that you can line him up anywhere. You can put him at the nose tackle. You can put him at a rush end one way or another with all of the different defensive fronts that you see in the NFL they believe that Tuli Tui Pelotu has a chance to excel it doesn't matter where you put him the knock on him and honestly I don't think it's much of a knock because if you're that intense and focused you will take criticism hopefully the knock on him is that he must get stronger so you tell a guy like that to go into the weight room yeah, I believe he'll get the message and follow through. So that would be the second person that I believe gets taken off of USC's available draft, uh, drafted players, draftable players. Then things start to get interesting. Andrew Voorhees, God love him. 
He was dependable. He played multiple positions for USC. He was one of a couple of offensive linemen that I think were absolutely crucial to the Trojans making a massive turnaround from the Clay Helton era to the Lincoln Riley, uh, to the Lincoln Riley's turn as head coach. He projects as a guard, but you can't expect him to play next year. Why? Well, because he tore his ACL toward the end of the season. You might recall that. He still went to the combine, not to run 40s, not to jump. He at least wanted to show NFL scouts what he could do, and he absolutely blew people away on the bench press. 38 reps of 225 pounds, and believe me, that left an impression. So yeah, you don't necessarily expect him to play next year, but before he blew out his knee, he was beloved. Pro football focus thought he was the ninth best guard in the nation. So I, there, there was another uh, thing that I read that said, yeah, if he didn't get hurt, he would have been taken in the third round. So there's a possibility that he gets taken as a flyer in the sixth, that he sits a year to get his knee healthy again, and then all of a sudden just blows up in his second year. So there is a possibility Andrew Voorhees is third off the board but again, it starts to get late for the Trojans there. And that's indicative of the program. They were rebuilding on the fly. They were built with damn fine players. But how many of them elevated their draft stock? You take Travis Dye, the running back, complete. The scouts call him complete. They love everything about him. They love that he blocks. They love the way he catches passes. They think he's quick. They think he's tough. They just don't see him as a starter. The way the scouts look at things. I've read a number of place of people that place him being taken in the draft at round seven, round seven for Travis Dye. And remember, he too suffered a season ending injury toward the end of the year. So that might also hurt his draft stock. Makai Blackman, the cornerback, is also seen as a day three selection, just not necessarily with a round attached. He could go anywhere on day three. They believe he's feisty with average size and speed, that he is uh, fluid, that he can knock down passes or make picks, and that he also is willing to stick his nose in to play run defense. The problem is, again, sometimes NFL scouts get really obsessed with things such as number with, with the numbers game. What is your 40 time? How big are your hands? As ridiculous as that sounds, they do measure it. They do count it. So they imagine him as not necessarily as a starter, but as a dime package guy. Now keep in mind, the NFL is using a lot more nickel and a lot more dime coverage. So there's a really good shot that he lands himself an everyday job in the NFL just not necessarily as a number one uh, corner. Now you're starting to look at players that might get drafted or might have to relook at their career, whether they go to the USFL or XFL. Bobby Haskins, another offensive lineman who had a terrific senior year. The scouting reports on him, they tend to be unified, that he's smart, that he fights, the problem is he is considered, you've heard the term tweener. That's Haskins. He's a little inconsistent in blocking against the pass. Not terrible, just inconsistent. And he's a little bit too small, they say, against the run. So he was a tackle for USC, but if he winds up getting a job at the NFL, they're probably going to wind up switching him to guard. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But because of the fact that they see these little nicks in his game, does he get drafted? Possible, possible, but not necessarily a sure thing. Brett Nealon, the center, also had a terrific season. They like the fact that he's quick into his blocks, but again, bit of a tweener. How so? Because he needs assistance, apparently, when it comes to inside blocking. Would he get overwhelmed by an elite nose tackle? That's a distinct possibility. That is the knock on him. He fights, he's solid, but 
do you see him as a starting center? There is a question about that. So maybe he gets drafted. Maybe he gets a, a gig as a practice squad player. The last two players that I'm going to mention, I have not seen any, any scouts, any inside sources, any mock drafts that go seven rounds, include them in the list. That would be defensive tackle Brandon Peely. They say he's only a marginal pass rusher, that he has trouble getting through the crowd in pursuit when the play goes to the outside. He'll get a look. That's the best I hear of uh, Brandon Peely, that he's going to get a look. And then you have Terrell Bynum. They think he's got good size. They think he's quick. The problem with him, he did not elevate his game. Remember, he was one of a number of wide receivers, skill position players that transferred into USC when they saw that Lincoln Riley was taking things over. Terrell Bynum never took over a game. Other wide receivers did make a name for themselves with Lincoln Riley. Bynum simply wasn't. So didn't make a name for himself at Washington, didn't make a name for himself at USC. It would be a stretch to imagine him making a name for himself being a seventh rounder or so in the NFL draft. But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. This is the first of four special reports. We'll be back in a little bit to talk about UCLA's prospects going into the NFL draft. And if you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking USC athletics almost every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We will be back soon with another special report. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Cortel Queso production. Take care.